It's a pleasure to uh, be there for many reasons. First, uh, to have a debate shared by you. We have been, uh, we are former colleagues. Um, coming back to European times in the 80s and 90s, and uh, many thanks to the Institute, because um, I know that uh, there has been a succession of uh, uh, remarkable speakers. I'm very specialized uh, in covering such a subject since uh, you have had the wider European view recently given uh, by David O'Sullivan. Of course, when I knew I would speak here, I called David uh, and I renewed yesterday. I said, I will be following your steps uh, in my, for my corner, but uh, I know you have been uh, uh, giving the, the wider view for external action service and so on. And he said, well, fine, go on. I will be myself in Ireland speaking on another subject today. So it shows that there is a very sustained uh, uh, flow of... Uh, messages and contributions coming from Brussels those times, and Claude Fransarnou, uh, another very good colleague, has been uh, talking about uh, security, procurement, and so on. So uh, I think it's a very good opportunity. And of course, um, this is uh, done on the occasion of uh, very useful consultations uh, with the forthcoming uh, presidency uh, chairmanship in office. I use the OSC words. There is EU presidencies and there is OSC chairmanship in office, so everybody in this coded system understands immediately uh, uh, which organization it, uh, is at stake and so on and so on. So, uh, in order to cover subjects which, yes, may be less familiar but has great significance, and I think will be for Ireland uh, a matter of uh, vigilance uh, during uh, next year. Uh, and I will try to, to give uh, somewhat the picture of the, the main stakes into uh, this quite fascinating region. Uh, it's a region uh, which uh, has been forgotten in a way and which uh, we have to, to rediscover. Uh, forgotten, I dare to say, for centuries because it lost its existence after having been a crucial historical links, link between worlds apart. I mean, uh, uh, as uh, we all know, uh, Rome discovered uh, silk through the Silk Road, I mean, uh, 2,000 years ago, and so on and so on. And uh, therefore, I mean, this uh, uh, region has a history of its own, but uh, between the uh, development of the Russian Empire, uh, you had the moment of the great game, uh, but then uh, you had uh, the uh, establishment of the Soviet Union, and, of course, um, the whole region has been taken into a very specific system where one didn't speak about Central Asia, but one did speak about Soviet Union. So, all of a sudden, this region had to uh, rediscover itself, in a way, even more because this country were not aspiring, uh, wanting independence. Uh, almost on the contrary, they were scared by the the breakup of the Soviet Union. It's well known that President Nazarbayev was very much in favor of maintaining the Soviet Union. And in a way, uh, one can say that the best elite of this past system uh, coming from the region was aspiring in finding its corner into the Soviet system at last because they had gone through uh, the step-by-step -step selection of some elites within the system which would allow to some of them once again, uh, the best example was uh, President Nazarbayev as more or less already earmarked by uh, President Gorbachev and so on. So it has been kind of upside down uh, uh, transformation for their even political and psychological representation of their relation to the world. Uh, but now, I mean, this distant, almost forgotten uh, region is becoming a crucial region, uh, crucial uh, for global security challenges. Uh, for the future of Afghanistan beyond 2014, very clearly, and even for EU ambitions uh, be beyond its eastern neighborhood. I mean, we cannot say uh, Europe engagement stops there. I mean, this is impossible. Uh, and even more, we have uh, clear calls from the region to engage and, and to do more. Uh, I take the opportunity to say that uh, the map here uh, should help to, to, to have a sense of uh, both, uh, both the, the, the vast and 
array of uh, land and territory which are covered by this uh, region. To give you an idea, the border of Kazakhstan with Russia uh, is 7,000 kilometers. Just to, to give an idea of the, and this of course was not planned. Uh, I mean, this was, this was just the outcome of technical administrative divisions in Soviet times. Uh, and therefore, uh, by sheer accident of history, now this has to be a state border managed in a problem, in, in, with all the prerequisite of a state border. And we know what it means. It's a complex thing. And so on and so on. Uh, you could say the same about the Fergana Valley, where you can see the intrication uh, of these uh, three countries, where there are, each is encroaching the other in the Fergana Valley, where you, you have the the mix of the three colors. This is the most populated area. This is the historical place where precisely the Silk Road went. This is the Fergana Valley. And so the combination of constraints connected with population of high density there, uh, having to live within the three countries with minorities and so on. I stop there about the characterization of the region. I think that these two extreme examples give an idea of uh, the complexities we'll have uh, uh, to, we are confronted to. We have a region where what we call the global security challenges are very much uh, in the center of the concerns. Um, well, they, we know them, uh, terrorism, extremism, uh, drugs, drug trafficking is an enormous challenge in the region because as you know, 92, 93% of heroin produced in the world is coming from Afghanistan in present context. <laughs> Uh, but also impact of financial crisis, environment, more precisely water. So, I mean, you have a, a good measure of the weight of what we call the global challenges in this region. Add to that the political impact of the Ara Spring, uh, where I will come a bit uh, back to it. I mean, clearly, uh, in view of these presidential regimes, uh, you you can be sure that in this region, uh, these uh, events of the last, uh, uh, since last autumn have been watched with very intense attention, both from uh, leaderships, from political circles, and so on. So um, all this, uh, uh, in order to, to add about the problematics, social situation is very serious in many respects. You have won uh, some of the poorest countries in the world, uh, with uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, because they are two mountainous uh, countries. 92% uh, of Tajik territory is mountainous, so what it leaves to, for normal uh, agriculture and uh, uh, normal ways of communication is uh, very little. This is Tajikistan, is the violet uh, part, this is uh, Pamir, uh, part where you have Tajikistan, I mean it's between uh, 4,000 uh, 4, and 7,000 uh, meters high. This is the, 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 the core of the Pamir. Uh, also, uh, one has to, to take into account um, uh, the uh, uh, ethnic uh, dimension, uh, so uh, all this uh, means that uh, we have uh, a very complex situation and leaderships uh, which have been more or less the same in the last 20 years and uh, through uh, just uh, uh, change and precisely uh, that's why Arab Spring has, has an impact is now uh, uh, very much uh, a question of today. Uh, final uh, introductory consideration, we are in tough financial times, why should we care for this region? And so at a time where we have to do I mean, of course, the constraints are quite serious for the EU and for all member states. And still, we have to do. So we have started uh, already, my first point, the uh, EU strategy for Central Asia. Uh, first, an, uh, EU started with the establishment and recognition in the logic of the uh, Maastricht Treaty and follow-up to uh, identify Central Asia as a region where EU should be active. Uh, and then you have uh, this well-known formula of the uh, uh, action, common uh, action decided by the Council, appointment of a special envoy, a special representative in charge of this, uh, uh, of this mandate. And this started in 2005 with Jan Kubisch, 
uh, then uh, left after one year becoming uh, uh, foreign minister of uh, Slovakia, and I took over in 2006. Uh, interesting to note, it was after the events in Andija, uh, exactly in Fergana Valley, Uzbek uh, um, uh, revolt, which was uh, crushed in a way which uh, created strong uh, EU reaction with sanctions, which have been overcome now, but have weighed very much on the kind of growing interest from a central, uh, on Central Asia from the European Union and difficult times in our relations with Uzbekistan. Interesting to note, this was done in 2005. It was not done in 2001, uh, after 9-11. So uh, the awakening, I would say, of European interest was not so quick and so fast and so security-centered. I mean, Andijan was the spark which uh, uh, launched uh, the process. Uh, then uh, it took uh, a real move forward uh, thanks to German presidency in uh, 2007, uh, first half of 2007, and uh, it was one of the ambitions of German presidency to establish a strategy for Central Asia. Uh, this uh, has been uh, uh, prepared in, uh, during these months and adopted by the European Council, that is at the top level. Uh, what is the EU strategy for Central Asia? I will not enter into detail now. I'm ready to, 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 to answer two more questions uh, uh, from you. But uh, let's it characterize and we'll leave some uh, uh, some booklets describing it in detail. This is available on the net anyway, uh, but uh, the initial uh, document or strategy is attached within this uh, uh, booklet with the uh, sequential documents uh, developing uh, the key items. It is a global long-term approach. Uh, the purpose is to establish a long-term partnership with Central Asian countries. This is not a five-year plan, this is not a three-year uh, initiative, the idea is to work on the long term because of the amplitude of the challenges, of the dimension of the region, and because of the potential complementarity. We can bring uh, very important uh, factors for this opening of this uh, uh, landlocked area. These are the most uh, remote states from any sea. Uh, when you look at the landmass, I mean, you understand, indeed, it's Central Asia. Uh, or Eurasia, whatever, uh, you have different qualification. But so, I mean, here there's really something to do together, indeed. Uh, Long-term approach, because you have just uh, burgeoning, starting uh, countries where they will need uh, steps to, 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 to develop. Um, uh, we have identified priorities. They are very simple and stark, but it has been a careful work of selection. I quote them quickly. One is uh, rule of law, human rights, and democratization. Second is education. Three is trade and uh, investment. Four is energy. Uh, five is uh, environment and water. And six is common threats, which is quite a uh, bold qualification of these uh, remote uh, regions, uh, EU and Central Asia, you can argue. But this is exactly what I described, challenges, global challenges global threats. And therefore, I mean, it, it covers some key priorities uh, in order to organize our commitment, our work. And uh, we have tried to have a calibrated action, not to expand everywhere. Uh, we were working a bit piecemeal before with TASIS programs, which are known for uh, knowledgeable public uh, like yours, uh, because it has been the, uh, the, the framework of the projects of the EU precisely of the, the record of Russia in the whole CIS, uh, but we moved to a more political and uh, uh, global encompassing uh, uh, approach, uh, and also with the purpose of established on-the-ground delegations. When we started the um, strategy in uh, 2007, we had only one delegation present. Now we have three uh, well-established, and the EU delegation, it means uh, 30 to, to 40 to 50 people covering all the aspects and now including politics, political situation after the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, we are going to open uh, soon uh, another one in the key place, which is Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan. After having gone to this difficult process I uh, mentioned to you, and we have to complete uh, in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan. 
So this has been the, let's say, the dynamic of the strategy. We are going to review it next year after five years with uh, another mm -hmm. report to the European Council to have an assessment where we are, what uh, our lessons learned, uh, how to, to adjust uh, further development. Of course, this doesn't mean that the European Union is working there in spite or um, uh, beyond or forgetting about member states. European Union member states, some of them have been committed and very committed to our Central Asia, depending on historical links, interests, uh, special uh, uh, fields of interest. To give you an idea, Kazakhstan is the first worldwide producer of uranium, uh, together, well, more or less on par with Australia, beyond Canada, and uh, has established uh, 30 uh, years contracts with, uh, of delivery from Japan to China and to other uh, countries. So uh, real stakes in terms of resources and not only gas and oil. And of course, uh, this means a lot for uh, uh, great economic opportunities. Uh, therefore, uh, this uh, presence of EU um, as such is, uh, of course, taking stock and uh, looking for some kind of cross-fertilization uh, from uh, the experience of member states on the ground uh, with, uh, one must say, limited diplomatic presence. Uh, well, most, uh, you have uh, 12 to 15 European countries present in Kazakhstan or in Uzbekistan, the big uh, two countries, but only two in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, three uh, in Tajikistan, and four, five, uh, five in uh, Turkmenistan. So, more or less, uh, there, is, uh, there are some uh, assets uh, from uh, member states, but the idea of coming together in a structured way uh, does make sense uh, because things are moving quickly. I would add, to describe this strategy that is not acting alone, uh, we fully recognize that other international organizations have been very much involved, and especially United Nations and OSC. And once again, this is why, I mean, this good understanding of who is doing what in Central Asia uh, does uh, make sense uh, for especially the relations between uh, OSC and uh, European Union, uh, the crisis in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the border management, counter-terrorism have been uh, already a field where we are working closely. My second one would be to say that we are now, and this is part of this need for uh, closer attention, we are in transition. Uh, things are moving in the field of security or uh, uh, evolution of this uh, Central Asian, uh, these five Central Asian countries, and therefore uh, we must also adapt our way to uh, act in uh, Central Asia. Uh, first and foremost, let's look at uh, what happens in uh, Central Asia itself. Uh, first, uh, Central Asia specific problem, uh, the internal evolution. I told that uh, basically these countries have started with founding presidents, and so uh, the transition of generation in the leadership is going to take place. Um, after 20 years of uh, quite remarkable political stability, which has been called uh, presidentialism, hyper-presidentialism, uh, together with uh, constitutions which are uh, quite uh, recognizable, because we have to remember these five countries are members of OSC. And that's why we have put in our priorities in first rank rule of law, human rights, democratic reform, because we do share this commitment with five OSC countries, which are young and new countries, and still in the making in a way, uh, but at the same time, we cannot forget about these common values and this commitment. And this is part of our dialogue with them. But uh, the transition uh, means, of course, a time of uh, potential political tension, turmoil, uh, upheavals. And we have seen that, well, at the very beginning in Tajikistan, uh, with the civil war, which was horrible, six months, uh, 100,000 uh, uh, victims. Uh, but then stabilization, national reconciliation. And by the way, here OSC has been working a lot, and that's why OSC is very present, uh, almost one team of uh, 100 people, because they are everywhere as a follow-up of this uh, 
uh, national reconciliation. But uh, you have had also change in uh, uh, Turkmenistan, a smooth change from President Niyazov, uh, who died in December 2006, with President Berdi Mohamedov. But we have seen turmoil in Kyrgyzstan, first time in 2005, uh, departure of uh, President Bakiev, uh, Akayev, rather peaceful, almost no victim. Then uh, President Bakiev, but things begin to worsen uh, in the last uh, years, and with a sudden shock of the 7th of April, uh, with the departure of the uh, uh, President Bakiev, and the beginning of a transition with a new constitution, aspiration to uh, parliamentary democracy, and at the same time, ethnic confrontation, 10th to 14th of uh, uh, June last year, two months after the events, 500 dead in the Fergana Valley in Orsh and Jalabad, 400,000 refugees on the roads. Well, then they returned to their home, most of them, but this was a deep shock, and we are still working on that altogether. So uh, this is uh, a real challenge from inside. But uh, there is also, I mentioned, the uh, uh, Arab Spring as another signal that the, the question of change of leadership and, uh, and uh, potential risk. Uh, because where, if you look at Kyrgyzstan, you can argue that it was a kind of pre-Tunisia. That is, the feeling of a locked political situation, a frustrated generation, the impression of a glass ceiling if you are not the son of a general or a cousin of a minister, even for the best elite, there is no future. And with a president with a kind of satrapic position and frustration leading to the main square, demonstrations, shooting from the president's short guard, people not fearing bullets, lots of victims, and at the end of the day, the president left. So this was 10th of April, uh, 7th of April, to a 10, uh, and what we have seen since in the Arab world, well, with differences, show that, well, what we see is a very complex process of change, full of risk, and we can measure that after the initial aspiration, where does it go, is a big question mark. So, uh, this kind of reflection of how to, 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 to proceed, how to, to understand, is very important. You have transregional factors I've already mentioned. I come back quickly to the main uh, problems, very quickly. Afghanistan, 2014 has been set as a turning point for transition, transfer of responsibility. And this we always repeat, but in these uh, uh, countries you have the feeling of a black hole and the idea that you have to prepare for the unknown which we are deeply convinced is not the case because, I mean, this has been a long-term investment and you have the security dimension and you have the cooperation dimension. Uh, I always give the example to my Central Asian interlocutors. We plan uh, already operations beyond 2014 in the finances of the EU. So we'll be there. And now you have 13,000 Europeans engaged into Afghanistan, not only on the military, but also on the development side. So, this is not as caricatural as described, but there is a sense of uncertainty, and therefore, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, fear that uh, there could be either a spillover or growing problems for Central Asia uh, after 2014 is a matter we have to cope with very carefully, and therefore we welcome the growing renewal interest for <coughs> neighborhood of Afghanistan as part of the solution and the work to be done for Afghanistan, and especially Central Asia. Of course, Pakistan is very important, but northern neighborhood of Afghanistan is also very important, and especially in context with the drug trafficking, which is the curse of the region. There is no need to have long uh, development of this, just read the reports of Uni United Nations uh, Organization Against Drug and Crime in Vienna. They give perfect picture of the reality. And if you want to know more about the roots, you look at uh, the, the, the map of HIV developments in Central Asia, and you have the roots of what is taking place. So, I mean, this is a real challenge. The other, I already mentioned, are the problem of management of borders. And then we have energy. I've not mentioned up to now, 
in a way deliberately. Of course, this is one of the main reasons of our interest. But I always try to react to the kind of caricatural disruption which says, well, you Europeans discover Central Asia because you need gas and oil. Sorry. I mean, we have 30,000, uh, uh, I said, s European citizens engaged in Afghanistan, risking daily their life, be it on the civilian side as well as on the military side. So we do care for security of this region. And we do care about extremism, terrorism, and we know what it means in our cities, and as well as uh, for drug trafficking. So security, stability is the first reason of our commitment and the challenge we have there. But of course, energy is also a matter of interest for us and for them, because they are landlocked far away from the big routes. And so you have to develop this potential, and then you have to transport it. And here, the interesting development of the last years has been the fact that, uh, thanks to a pipeline to China, December 2009, the established quasi-monopoly of Gazprom in transportation of gas in Central Asia has been opened into a new uh, energy paradigm which will emerge step by step in the region. I will not enter in detail now, I just wanted to, to mention that, uh, because I didn't before, uh, for the reason I, I just told you. So, uh, in view of that, because of our limitation of resources, we have, in this transition, to think of pooling of resources in order to cope with this rather uh, challenging transition. We all have capacities. Uh, EU, through its strategy, is expanding its presence, not in a dramatic way, but methodical, because we have a long-term logic. But uh, here we have to really work together. Uh, the key problem and the additional reason for us to commit ourselves there is that you have a lack of regional coordination. There is almost no regional organization taking these five countries. They are just emerging. They want to be themselves first before then entering into what we know as integration and so on and so on. And therefore, other organizations, supranational uh, regional organizations, international organizations have a role to play. Maybe we are too many to do that, let's precisely find a good distribution of work. And this can be a good uh, cooperation to the benefit of uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, precisely, uh, it's already what I mentioned, uh, between EU, UN, and OSCE, in the end, we can have a good work sharing pattern. And uh, the, 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 the dimensions of the challenges, I mean, water is a huge problem. Nobody has a solution for water. Only well-coordinated contributions will help to improve the rather dismal management of water in the present condition. I take this example. I would finish in a quick description of the other partners, because we have been late com comers and others have been there for a very long time or uh, in a very substantial proportion. Let's start with Russia, of course because it has been uh, the historical uh, master of the region for centuries, not just uh, 20th century. Uh, it started in the 17th century. So uh, the question now in this post-Soviet period, is Russia a contender of uh, EU engagement or a partner for EU engagement? We have opened immediately when we started this consultation, open dialogue with Russia, and we uh, exchange uh, regularly on the subject in a rather methodical way, and we have adopted from the beginning the idea of transparency. We have nothing to hide from the uh, European Union, we have no hidden agenda, <coughs> and we look to the region in the logic of cooperative security, for precisely the reason I, I mentioned. Who has a solution for water? Is there a Russian or Chinese or American solution or European? No. I mean, the only way to cope with it is precisely to combine efforts. So there is a lot of work to do together for all interested partners in Central Asia in view of the dimension of the problem, from poverty to drug trafficking. And we see, for example, Russia very much the first victim of this drug trafficking, now wanting more coordination, and we do welcome that. And therefore, well, we may have a competition, of course, but this is not confrontation. This is a normal mix of cooperation and competition, be it on energy or on other matters. So uh, we start from the idea that the commonality of interest will emerge more and more when the challenges in this country will emerge. This is not a naive 
This is just resting on evidence. We could see that uh, in the past year in Kyrgyzstan, in the end. We have been consulting constantly with the Russians, even if they have their own preferences or, or their own options. But it's a rule for us. I'm, when I visit Kyrgyzstan, and I've been on a monthly basis for the last year and a half, I always meet with the Russian ambassador. And if there's a Moscow special envoy, I will meet with him. So this is our line of conduct. Second, United States. We are uh, in this logic of this growing commitment. It shows that in this region we have not been saying, well, let's have the United States uh, uh, do the pull the heavy weight uh, for us. On the contrary, <coughs> we have our own logic, which is related to OSCE uh, and uh, to this need to uh, take seriously uh, the fact that we have common references, even if these countries are just at the beginning of a long democratization process. And that's why we feel committed. Of course, uh, United States have had special attention for security interests, and uh, this is where we have been working closely with them. You have the Manas uh, Air Base uh, point as key transfer to uh, Afghanistan. You have had the Northern Distribution Network, which is now more and more a key point for ISAF in Afghanistan because of the threats on the normal route through Pakistan, for reasons you know. Quickly, China has been more and more involved economically. Uh, and seems now to measure, because of the new, these new challenges, that it would have to look for security. And therefore, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is more some kind of political framework than a real organization, uh, and which should have been more economic in the view of the Chinese, is now looking more at security. I would like also to uh, mention Turkey, because Turkey has historical links. Four of the five countries are Turkic. Uh, uh, fam uh, language uh, family. Uh, the exception is Tajikistan, which uh, uh, where uh, they speak Dari, that is the Persian family. And so they have, uh, they are uh, strongly uh, interested. Uh, we share priorities with them, bit on human rights, democratization, on energy, because of the fourth corridor we are uh, beginning to shape. Uh, from Turkmenistan through Caspian, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and uh, Southeast Europe. Uh, we come, can have, of course, because of historical dimensions, different views into uh, the logic of Turkic neighborhood compared to uh, our own uh, approach to Central Asia. In conclusion, uh, one can argue that uh, Central Asia is not a priority for the EU and will never be. But this is not the problem. Uh, after political oblivion, and piecemeal operations, uh, we have now a more and more common perception by all member states thanks to this mobilization of the strategy, and we build overall diplomatic presence, calling for contributions from all sides. Central Asia is a long-term incremental investment with two regions, EU and Central Asia, getting closer on both sides in terms of interaction. Uh, we need to take a continent-wide approach uh, because this is really uh, the only way to cope with this uh, vast region. Um, we uh, uh, offer, uh, uh, and we are in a long si historical cycle, uh, which in fact started to involve Central Asia uh, with Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. This is where uh, historically, I mean, there was the beginning of a process, and we are still, I think, in this cycle. Uh, uh, we bring uh, uh, our capacities, we offer markets, technologies, uh, competence, finances. Uh, we learn to have a wider vision of our, our environment, and we have to. And what we bring, I think, basically to Central Asia is alternative options, <laughs> other uh, perspectives. They have strong neighbors. We are not a strong neighbor. We, have, we can become a very substantial partner. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.